the very edges of the Roman Empire, survival was far from guaranteed. There were over 5,000 kilometers of frontier to defend, stretching across mountains, forests and deserts. Living in harsh conditions, watched by enemies ready to pounce at the first sign of weakness, the Romans had to come up with ingenious ways to keep their men alive. In the decades after the Roman invasion of Britain, the legions had proved themselves almost irresistible on the battlefield. But Roman commanders still had a problem. They had to maintain a presence in potential trouble spots and snuff out rebellions before they could even begin. The solution was to build a string of Roman forts along the frontier to show the local population that the empire was here to stay. In this episode, I've been posted to the wild Welsh frontier, where, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, a full-sized Roman fort is under construction. At Park in the past, meticulous research is being used to recreate an authentic first century landscape. I've come here to find out what life was really like for the soldiers who served in these remote outposts across the empire, surrounded by locals who were often less than welcoming. Someone had the great idea of us getting shot at by a Sarmatian horse archer. Uh, yep. Crikey. With the help of volunteers from the Roman Military Research Society, I'll discover how the Romans maintained a military edge over their adversaries. Yakite. Got it. Ooh. Headshot. And just how likely it was. Feel nice and safe in here. That you'd make Yakite. it out alive. Yakite! By the middle of the 1st century AD, it's estimated that around a quarter of a million men served in the Roman army. The vast majority spent their time at the extreme edges of the empire, posted from the Sahara Desert to the Scottish borders. In fact, very few would ever set eyes on Rome or the emperor. Members of the elite Praetorian Guard might have been able to bask in the grandeur of the capital, but most would have got used to less lavish surroundings. At sunrise, a trumpet blast would signal that a hard day of work had begun. Now, if you were stationed in a permanent fort rather than a temporary marching camp, you'd probably wake up in a simple barrack block like this one. You'd have eight men to a room. That group was known as a contubernium, and the idea was that those soldiers would form strong bonds over their term of service. Now, as you can see, there's not very much privacy, but it could have been much worse. If you were in the cavalry, you'd have been sharing a room with your horse. This simple room was where soldiers socialized, stored their belongings, and cooked meals. You'd need to keep your roommates on side, as I quickly found out. Getting dressed was apparently a two-man job. A small fort like this one would have typically been occupied by auxiliary troops, perhaps not a full cohort of 500 men, but a smaller task force known as a vexillatio. These provincial soldiers accounted for at least half of Rome's military manpower, but were often looked down on by the better paid legionaries. Just like in the legions, auxiliary units were divided into so-called centuries of 80 men, each commanded by an experienced soldier with a fearsome reputation. Uh, centurion? Hello, um, I'm here for my first day in the auxiliaries, uh, reported for duty. Can you explain, what is an auxiliary? You. Me? Yes, you. Recruited from the provinces. So you're not a citizen soldier yet. This man is. Okay. He's a legionary soldier, and that's basically what it is. You have to be a, you have to be a Roman citizen before you can join the legions. 
But if you're not, you can join the auxiliary cohorts. So if you're recruited from Britannia or any other provinces and you're not yet a citizen, that's where you'd end up being in the auxiliary cohorts. Serve your time. That could be up to 25 or 26 years, depending on when the discharge is done. And then you will be granted your citizenship, which also has the added bonus of recognising any family you have. So if you have a son, up to that point, the law doesn't recognise him as a Roman citizen. Beyond that point, of course, he's now a Roman citizen and he can join the legions. Right. So essentially anyone that's within the, the sort of bounds of the Roman Empire who isn't a citizen can join up as an auxiliary Absolutely. and yes. there, are, there are incentives in place for them to do so. Yes. Why are the auxiliaries sent to these frontier forts when the, the legionaries kind of get to do all the, the fighting on the open battlefields? Well, that again is, is slightly incorrect in the sense that auxiliaries are fighting troops. The legionary soldiers are also the engineers, so they're building roads and, and uh, you know, aqueducts and things like this. So the legionaries have got dual roles, but the auxiliaries are purely really recruited into for fighting skills. Um, and we would recruit people for, with particular skills. So if you've got archers, uh, like for example, the Hamian archers from Syria, they were renowned for it. So they started young boys and they train up to the young men. Perfect. We want archers. We'll recruit them. That will, might even be their uh, bounty, if you like, from the province to the empire. Um, there you might have, in Britain, you might have a cavalry. Uh, you certainly have uh, a Sarmatian cavalry, for example, from over on the plains. Um, also, you have to bear in mind that um, if you're policing an empire, the last thing you want is for you to policing your local tribe where you've yeah. come from. Because if, let's imagine, if something happens and you're, the instruction is you're ordered to go and attack that tribal centre where your uncle, your brothers, your not father, likely. you're not going to do it, are you? So one of the key things in the early part of the empire was to move people away from where they come from. So if you were, say, in Syria, you bring to, you're brought to Britain. If you're in Britain, you're sent to Germany or something like that. You know, so you're messed up, moved around. So here in Britain, you tend to find that, as you say, the, the, the soldiers who uh, left records at Hadrian's Wall or, or wherever it might be, they're, they're not British, are they? Sometimes they're from the other end of Europe. Yes, yeah, yeah. We've got records of, of like I say, uh, Hamian archers from Syria. You've got the Tigris boatmen, so they're from Iraq or Mesopotamia. Uh, you've got uh, Batavians and Tungrians. They're from sorry, northern, northern Germany, northern Holland, that sort of area. Uh, they're up on the wall as well. But this rather brings us into the idea of, of, of the typical view of what a Roman, everyone thinks a Roman soldier looks like. So usually it's the, the short tunic, uh, the open-toed cali guy or, or boots. There is a, a tale of the 14th Legion soldiers returning from Germany, heading back to Rome, and the local Italians being terrified that this barbarian army was approaching Rome because the guys were all wearing long sleeves, long trousers, enclosed boots with beards. They just did not look how everybody thought a Roman soldier should appear. Indeed, archaeological evidence suggests that there was a great deal more variety in Roman arms and armour than Hollywood might suggest. In the imperial period, kit was issued to new recruits by the state, but it was the responsibility of individual soldiers to maintain, repair and replace their gear as needed. What you were given was unlikely to be brand new either. One first century bronze helmet discovered near London was punched with the names of four owners and was probably used by many more. Typically what we, go, what we see is uh, you would be dressed in a male shirt with a brass or bronze uh, helmet, right? whereas our legionary soldier is often typically depicted with an iron helmet, iron segmented or banded armour. This comes from Trajan's column. And Trajan's column is a piece of propaganda for the, for the emperor to say his, his uh, conquest of Dacia or re modern Romania as it is now. The artist who did that, did that column divided the, t the army into distinct categories. So you, he always depicts the legionary in this type of equipment and the auxiliaries in the male shirts and the difference. But if we go to a different set of uh, reliefs in Romania itself, most of the soldiers are shown wearing male or scale, not that. So what's going on? The answer is that I'm, I'm sure we, not sure we really know. So, given that the appearance of Roman soldiers defied neat stereotypes, what generalisations can we actually make? 
you've got some kind of protection for your head, some kind of protection for your body, you're carrying some kind of shield, some kind of pole weapon and a sword because the primary weapons of the Roman soldier are actually his sword and shield, his gladius and his scutum. This, the pilum, is a javelin, but it can be used in hand as well. So you can use it as a spear to thrust and, and, and stab at somebody, but it's intended to be thrown. Um, you might be issued a spear. So instead of a, a, the javelin, you have a spear. The spear is a fighting weapon. You hold it and you can fight with it. Take us through what marks you out as a centurion. There are basically three things. Um, when, we, when we see uh, funeral uh, gravestones of, of centurions, they're usually depicted with a helmet, with a crest that goes from side to side or ear to ear. Uh, that crest or crista um, is fixed to the helmet which makes kind of sense because you want to know where that centurion is in his century so I, my position in the, in the battle is at the front in the middle so every guy around me can see that and he knows where I am because I'm leading by, front the front um, then you have uh, the greaves the ocria this seems to be a throwback to an earlier period. So the ordinary soldiers are not wearing them in the first century AD. So the crest greaves, and the other one is the vitus. We call it vitus, a vine stick. Essentially, it's not necessarily from a vine, as in a grapevine, but it could be, as in, this, as in this case, a vine has grown round that and it's caused that twisted, gnarled look. Okay. This is a symbol of the centurion's rank and his authority, and it's a means by which I can also correct minor disciplinary issues. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So while soldiers don't want to be hit, they accept that they will be hit by a stick. Yes. Hit, hit, hit by the vetus. Um, not ideal if you're carrying your sword around. In no. The tag. Would I carry this in battle? Probably not. And is it true, so life in a fort, you would you'd start early and you'd usually start with some weapons training, right? Can do, yes, yeah. It depends what the, the training regime might be. It could, be. it could be we're going out on a march. So we march out for 20 miles, dig a marching camp, stay there, camp, sit and defend it all night, pack it all down. Let's just stick in here and do some weapons training. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that costs you, that does. <laughs> if you want to avoid the d dirty jobs, you sometimes had to bribe your centurion. Right, okay. So there we go. So if you want weapons training and not a big march. <laughs> so I've got in my pouch. Not wanting to embark on a hike through hostile territory, I was happy to do my morning exercise within sight of the fort. Not that this was going to be a walk in the park. The Romans took their training seriously. Anyone between the ages of 17 and 46 could theoretically enlist in the Roman army, and there were plenty of volunteers. Press gangs were unheard of, and conscription was rarely needed. New recruits were subjected to an intense medical examination, which left nothing to chance. Having too much intelligence, short fingers, or a missing testicle were all apparently frowned upon. Together with a legal background check, this process was called probatio. Once it was passed, would-be soldiers embarked on four months of basic training, designed to weed out anyone and suitable for army life. As if they've been born with weapons in hand, they never have a truce from military training and never wait for emergencies to happen. Their peacetime exercises are no less thorough than real warfare. Every soldier applies all his energy to training as if he was on the battlefield. Don't race ahead, don't race ahead. You want your Although nothing survives that might resemble an ancient drill manual, it's clear that Roman soldiers were taught how to work together. It was their ability to fight as a unit, rather than individual heroics, that would keep them alive. Okay, Mark, so I feel like I'm being whipped into shape. Now we're going to be shown a, a defensive strategy against cavalry, is that right? Yes, absolutely. The last thing you want to be doing is caught open, in open field with cavalry threatening you. So infantry are obviously worried, you know, massive amount of horse flesh charging at you. So we, we've come up with a solution. Uh, we know that the Romans use something similar. It is effectively, if you've heard of the testudo or tortoise, of course. it's a static version of that. But we're gonna create a, a, an offensive ray of javelins pointing towards our enemy horsemen, which for, for our purposes are gonna be coming from that direction in front of us. Great, let's That'll see if we sense. can pull this off. Yeah. Okie dokie. 
the rectangular scutum shields carried by Roman soldiers offered excellent protection. Curved in design to deflect glancing blows and large enough to cover the whole body if a man was kneeling down. Equis! Contra equites facitae! Unos! Duos! Tres! Quattro! Any horse that comes towards this will be scared by the sheer movement, let alone all the points facing them. If they are, if the rider is that brave, that's our job in the back ranks to throw a javelin at them. It's not the most comfortable, to be honest, but uh, feel nice and safe in here. Good. You should be. <laughs> Of course, the Romans hadn't earned their terrifying reputation hiding behind their shields. Over centuries of conquest, they'd mastered the combination of javelin and sword. So our next drill, Mark, we've done been attacked by cavalry, we've fended them off. Now there's infantry coming at us. What are we going to do? We're going to launch these javelins. That's our first line of attack. OK, this is the pilum, right? It's the pilum, absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to give ourselves a bit of space. So we're going to break out into a, like a checkerboard effect. I'll give you two the instruction to uh, charge forward. So impetum facite, charge forward. When you hear yakite, you're going to draw that arm back and then throw that javelin. Got it. All right. As soon as you've thrown that javelin, stop, draw your sword and get ready because you're now protecting these guys who would then do the same thing. Got it. Okay. Happy? So th these guys, they'll be throwing the peel and presumably when the enemy were quite close, right? To... Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking Olympic throwing here. We're yeah. talking sort of maybe 30 metres at maximum. Yeah. Um, perhaps it might be even closer than that. The idea of this thing is to punch through mail shirts or shields. Uh, and if it doesn't go all the way through to the man behind, then it gets stuck in the shield. Is it true that at the end breaks off? No. It's not true. No. That's a myth. Nor does this bend on impact. Right. OK. Well, when you stop and think about it, if it bends on impact, dink, it doesn't do its job. It's a penetrator. It's intended to go through things. So this has got to go. The tip of this pilum, this bit here, that's hard, hardened steel. This is perhaps not so, so it's a bit softer. Over time, yeah, the weight of the shaft and it could cause it to bend, but it's not designed to bend. That's one of those sort of shorthand mistakes that often gets quoted. Pila porta, take. Acquies aprite. Pila. Salite! Primus ordo insistite. Noissimus ordo impetum facite. Yakite! Draw sword. And now this guy, the guys would fire on the same thing, so we can roll it forward. Got it. Or we could come forward into one line, one solid line, whatever we want, whatever seems deems necessary to defeat the enemy over there. The intensity of training in the Roman army, under the watch of hard-nosed camp instructors, might seem conventional today, but it certainly made an impression on contemporary eyewitnesses. One ancient writer described Roman training exercises as bloodless battles, and Roman battles as training exercises with added blood. I was feeling almost combat ready, if I could only find my javelin. Unbelievable, that's coming out of your pace, soldier. <laughs> uh, where is it? I don't think I threw it that far. <laughs> well, this is embarrassing. Obviously, the Romans wouldn't need to actually get their javelins back <laughs> in the midst of battle. Despite their training, even the most disciplined troops were vulnerable when moving through unfamiliar territory. The destruction of three Roman legions in Germany in 9 AD, lured into an ambush in Teutoburg Forest, was a reminder that they weren't invincible. To neutralise the advantages of their enemy in the mountains, swamps and woodland of the frontier, the Romans needed to operate from positions of strength. It was a strategy they perfected during the conquest of Britain. No fort planted by Agricola was carried by storm by the enemy or abandoned by capitulation and flight. Sallies were frequent, for they were protected against a protracted siege by supplies for 12 months. No other general selected more shrewdly the advantages of sight. 
So this fort isn't actually on the site of an original ancient Roman fort, but it's not too far away. So the Romans did build a fort at Ruthin, which is over in that direction, and at Deva in that direction, that's modern day Chester. That was an important consideration when you were building or situating your defences. You needed to make sure that you were within a day's march of help. And so here on the Welsh frontier, the Romans built at least 30 auxiliary forts, all connected by straight roads. These fortifications are modelled on a real archaeological site at Crawford in Scotland, built around 80 AD under the Roman governor Agricola, an expert fort builder and a commander who would push the Roman Empire further north than anyone else. Military surveyors who built Roman forts appear to have had a great deal of leeway in how they adapted the basic design, but it's clear they were all working with the same theoretical principles. Forts were generally laid out as rectangles with rounded corners, the so-called playing card shape. If they were going to be occupied for a full campaigning season or longer, they would have a headquarters building, barracks and workshop and a recognisable street grid. Marching camps, meanwhile, might only be built for a single night stay, before being fully dismantled and burned down. So a fort like this one would have had at least three components to its defence. The first obstacle for attackers would be this V-shaped ditch, and they were dug deliberately that way. They were called ankle breakers. Basically, if you fell on one of these, you were probably in trouble. The earth that was excavated from the ditch was then piled up behind to make this rampart. And these were deliberately turfed to make them slippery. So if you can imagine trying to climb up a wet grassy slope with your armour and weapons, not very easy. On top of the rampart you've got this wooden palisade, they'd often be in stone. And you've got gatehouses and corner towers from where defenders would be able to rain down projectiles. And then finally, just for good measure, you've got these kind of ancient caltrops. So these stakes are called sudes. Each soldier would have carried these and they'd be tied together just to form another obstacle. Those defences, of course, were useless without vigilant soldiers manning them. One of the few surviving records of a soldier's duty roster, a first century papyrus from Egypt, shows just how much time the men spent guarding forts, roads and administrative buildings. Everyone would have had to learn how to deal with boredom. Probably the least favourite jobs for soldiers in a Roman fort would have been sentry duty. You'd have to spend hours up on these battlements staying alert, keeping an eye out for enemy soldiers, basically keeping your comrades inside safe. And we know that somewhere here, like Britannia, it would have got cold, it would have been wet. They wouldn't have been stood around in armour, they'd have been wearing thick woolen cloaks. They'd have probably had mittens, socks, woolly hats. We also know that some of the severest punishments in the Roman army were reserved for sentries who either deserted their post or fell asleep. The man who is found guilty is punished by the fustuarium. The tribune takes a cudgel and merely touches the condemned man, whereupon all the soldiers fall upon him with cudgels and stones. Generally speaking, men thus punished are killed on the spot. The result of the severity and inevitability of this punishment is that in the Roman army, the night watches are faultlessly kept. I'll tell you what, Callum, we have to go through some hardship, don't we? You've only been here five minutes. So ungrateful. One way to avoid some of the more tedious jobs in camp was to prove you had a specialised skill or trade. Carpenters, musicians and medical staff were among those designated as immunes, quite literally immune from laborious tasks like digging ditches and latrines. Luckily for me, there were no latrines to dig here. State-of-the-art toilets had already been built. 
The Romans took their sanitation seriously. They weren't just digging ditches outside of the fort. They had properly drained toilets with sewage systems that would take human waste out under the defences. The only problem was you had to share the bathroom with all of your comrades. And there was only one sponge to go around. Do you have to fill this every time? Yeah, sorry mate. Just a request guys, please subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment. There's loads more stuff coming. While I'd now taken a tour of the fort's impressive defences and toilet block, there was certainly a way to go to complete the interior buildings. I was keen to speak to the chief builder here to find out how difficult constructing a first century fort really is. So Gary, mm -hmm. is it fair to say that a lot of the fort around us, you've built it? Um, quite a bit of it, yeah. Um, both myself and my uh, colleague Vindex. I mean, so we've been the, the two primary here um, for the last year or so. Uh, we do have a number of volunteers which help us out, but obviously they're not always available. And uh, obviously some of the skill sets that we require aren't available to just you know, most, of the, most of the public, so it's a little bit difficult. So it's a very small team that you've got. You Extremely haven't got a full team. legion to, no, to help No, I you. wish. So, <laughs> yeah. so what are the kind of challenges that, that, that come with that? Presumably speed at which you can build it. Well, there's a speed at which you can build it and also the actual sheer physical challenges of you know, some of the um, construction that we actually have to undertake um, does require us to, you know, unfortunately, occasionally cheat sometimes in order to, you know, bring um, safety into the issue as well and you know manual handling particularly of you know things like the, the uh, frame bents that we've got here those require quite a bit of um, effort in order to put into place and make sure that they're safe. Understandable yeah, yeah. so we are stood right now in front of the Fabrica mm -hmm. so that's a workshop right yeah. and most Roman forts would have started with a building like this. Yeah, probably. I mean, sort of, it, it makes a sense that if you're going to build everything else you need, well, particularly here in Britain, you need a covered area that you're going to be able to sort of um, make use of whatever the weather. Because, you know, unless you've got a, a massive monsoon, you're just going to be working regardless. The workshop at a Roman fort would have been kept extremely busy, dealing with a never ending list of routine repairs and new construction projects. When one of Agricola's legionary fortresses in Scotland was dismantled and abandoned, the occupiers buried almost a million iron nails in a deep pit, most of which were probably manufactured on site. But at least some components of a Roman camp might have arrived ready-made. And you were saying earlier, the, many of the buildings within a fort like this one, for efficiency, the Romans would have brought them almost flat-pack style. Well, it's possible that um, the fabrica might have actually sort of been built in the actual fabricas in the main legionary bases, like particularly the one at Deer at Chester. They've got fabricas there that are almost like warehouse in size, and they've got to be doing something. So things like um, gateways, probably for these places, corner towers, some maybe important buildings would actually come literally on a cart for assembly. So you, you, you mentioned that you may have had to cheat a little bit with some of the earthworks and some of the heavy lifting, mm -hmm. yeah. but you have done a lot of it using traditional Roman oh, techniques, yeah, right? Definitely. So using tools yeah. like these. Can you talk to us a little bit about what some of these are for? Well, most of the tools that we use, I mean, you'll find derivatives in, in the modern day. I mean, um, things, simple things like chisels and what have you, they've been around um, literally since man started doing woodworking. I mean, obviously things like axes and what have you in the this, like this particular one, which is a side axe, used for actually sort of hewing logs out of the round into sort of square section and what have um, These again are very, very common things. Draw knives, which again are used for sort of trimming and cutting. Um, simple drills, simple saws. Yeah, we've been trying to emulate a lot of the things that would have actually been done. Obviously, we'll only do that for a small amount because we actually sort of have to get on with the, the main part of actually constructing this place. And What's next for you and the team? What's the what's the next project? Next for us, main one is, which is actually in the works at the moment, is the headquarters building, the Principia. Um, that's going to be roughly in the, the centre of the fort, right in front of the main entranceway for the big double gates here. Um, that is the administration building, but also, as nearly as important, the middle room at the back section of the Principia is the shrine to the standards. 
for the Roman units that's going to be here. That's going to be most probably the closest thing that we're going to have to a shrine, well, a shrine or a temple actually on site. And of course, below that, that's where we're going to have the strong room. That's the treasury, the right, where the money yeah. is kept. Where the money is kept. So you're going to be excavating an underground chamber for um, that? A certain amount, yes. With the land that we've actually got here, we can't basically dig too deep until we actually sort of hit water issues, unfortunately. So it'll most probably be that it'll be partly on the ground, but underneath a raised dais where we'll actually put the standards just slightly more elevated in order to honour the gods. Got it. Well, <laughs> we, we really look forward to seeing the rest of this place coming together. Good luck with Thank it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The Roman fort featured in this episode is the centrepiece of a unique heritage project called Britain's Big Fort Build. An exciting challenge to reconstruct an authentic, full-size auxiliary fort set within a rewilded first century landscape. It's the first complete conquest period fort to be built in Britain for nearly 2,000 years. And you can visit for a great day out and to see the build team in action. Please help by donating to this amazing project using the link on the screen right now. Right, time to get back to some training. While heavy infantry certainly formed the core of a Roman army, some of their most innovative military contraptions were designed to kill at a distance. Okay, so we've looked at some of the weapons that the Romans would have used in close combat, swords, uh, shields, peeler. Now we're looking at ranged weapons. We're looking at things that they would have potentially used to defend a fort like this. Yes, and in the case of the archer, you can also go hunting to uh, su supplement your rations. But this guy has been training all his life to become an archer like this. He's using a recurved bow, uh, composite materials. Uh, so you've got horn and sinew and uh, the wood itself to create a very powerful bow in a very short space. So they can be used both on foot and on horseback as well. Most soldiers would have learned to use a bow and arrow, but professional archers tended to be auxiliaries recruited from regions like Syria, Crete and North Africa, where shooting was a way of life. Still, even a beginner might get lucky. Shot. Okie dokie. Right, I'm going to give that back to you, Callum. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, we're moving on to our... Our next artillery piece now, yes. I'm guessing. This is uh, one of the smallest catapulta or bolt shooters that the Roman army had. It was originally found in Xanten Ward in Germany. It was found in the river, so it's a lot of it survived to us, or certainly the head part survived to us. So we can make a pretty accurate reconstruction of this thing. Uh, this is taking things a stage further because once you get to the stage where a bow is more powerful than the man can actually draw, you need to have some kind of mechanical means to do it. So if you'll notice, with this occasion, we can't bring the drawstring back to the, where the archer's fingers, whereas, that, whereas this, this is the trigger here so we've actually slid it forward to then engage the bowstring under the, tr under the fingers this is the trigger that's now locking it in place and our soldier now winches it back using a windlass and when he's got it as far back as he needs which is going to be all the way back here but if you notice as he's doing that that bowstring is drawing back on those arms and the arms themselves are causing those skeins of rope in the the black piece of the head there to be twisted so this is a torsion weapon bows are a tension weapon this is torsion so it's using a different power because those arms do not go all the way through so there's right. an awful lot of power now being stored up in there yeah. i guess uh, another advantage as an archer you can't stay there for very long exactly this can wait right it can wait it can wait we also have another advantage when he kicks it off the stand and now we have the advantage of he can elevate uh, he can traverse left and right and also to a, de to a degree depressed because obviously you don't want the bolts sliding away from the string. So now you can take aim, which is not as easy as it looks because you've got that large blocky wooden head at the front as we call it. So you can take aim and when you're ready, yak it in. Oh dear, <laughs> that was a bit pathetic. <laughs> yak it in. Oh, nearly. Nearly, nearly. nearly. Okay. He, do he doesn't have to be accurate. He's just shooting into a mob of the enemy over there. Well, we're going to move on to something more powerful now. Maybe we've got a chance with uh, well, this beast. It's a big brother. Uh, this is known as a trespithimus or three span. That little one we just shot is a two span. If you, if you know a span is the distance between your thumb and your little finger, that's one span. So it's, okay. the bolts are two spans long. This is three span. So if you look at them, they are three of those measurements along. 
Obviously, this is a much bigger machine. Uh, the size of the machines are actually dictated by these bronze washers. In the ancient manuscripts, which have been used to, to create these things, um, that is classed as one unit. Okay. So this frame is four units wide. Exactly the same as that one, but you'll notice the bronze washers on that one are that much smaller. So yeah. smaller machine, bigger machine. If you get the bigger washers, it goes up again. The guys in there, are you happy? Right. What's the what's the uh, the command to to fire? Yakite. We say yakite, yeah. All right, guys, are you ready? Yakite. Oh, it's got him. Mm. Oh, I tell you what, Ooh. that is a painful, painful in the let's say shot. top of the thigh, shall we? Top of the thigh. Yes, <sighs> yes. Um, great. So. We've killed one of them. Yep. Um, and now we're moving on to. Well, yeah, this is our, our, our chronologically most advanced. It is. Weapon. This is where the Romans have now taken on the, the mantle of, of designing the thing. So, what's actually fundamentally happened is we've got a machine that is able to use the, the string, the spring bundles are spread out on a metal frame. So, we've got uh, uh, the metallurgy has improved. So, we've gone from the wooden frame to the metal ones. All right. Is it in? That's it. That's it. So now you can you can just well, crank it back, work together. Uh, this way, yeah. Yep. Oh, that's that's not actually too difficult to do, is no. it? To, I guess you have to keep it fairly steady. Okay, I'd hold it about there. There's the bolt. So grab a bolt. Place okay. the bolt. Obviously, the nasty-looking thing. Pointy end towards enemy. Okay. In that's we on go. Top there. That's now resting against the bowstring. So all you need to do now is we need to aim it. Do you want to aim, aim it, Maximus? And then, uh, and then, if you wish to have a go, Louis, you can uh, pull that trigger when we're ready, and we'll see how far it goes. So you've got a bullseye here, pal. There we go. <laughs> is that the same guy? I don't know, but he's not very happy if it is. No, no, no. Okay, that's uh, that's two out of three. That's not too bad. Actually. It's not too bad. Not, not too bad. bad. Feeling that one of our plywood targets had been unfairly singled out, I thought it was only right to try and hit someone else. Not to mention, I really wanted to have a go. When you ready? Ready? Yaki take. <laughs> that was better, wasn't it? <laughs> Headshot. Might Headshot. have glanced off his helmet, maybe, but. If that hits your helmet, you're going to know it. <laughs> yeah. That's going to give you rattle your can a bit, isn't it? But yes, that's the idea of these. These machines are getting more and more powerful. And this is this is not the biggest. This, these get bigger. You can scale these up as well. So these are, can be a massive things. And, and they're obviously going to be used. They're, they're quite portable, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the legionaries are going to be carrying them around. Would they also have them sort of on the defences? Definitely, definitely on, on the, the towers. Defense? Anything like that, you're going to use that. You can use those to to uh, actually like any artillery piece. Or, or think of it in modern terms would be like a machine gun. Yeah, it doesn't operate like a machine gun, clearly, um, but it's that's that sort of idea that you're covering a ground length of ground in front of your gatehouse or between. So you've got one up there, one up there. Anyone comes towards that gate, they can be shot on filard, you know, in from the sides. And you, as an attacker, well, you know what happened to that guy might happen to you. Absolutely, it's a bit of a deterrent, isn't yeah. it? I mean, we, some of these bolts have been punching through armor before now. We've had that, so yeah, it's, it's pretty stuff. powerful machines, very powerful. Shooting at a static target from a safe distance felt comfortable enough, but for my final test, the tables were going to be turned. As Rome's frontier pushed further north and east in the 1st and 2nd centuries, they encountered the nomadic tribes of the Eurasian steppe. These people virtually lived on horseback and brought a brand of mounted warfare to Rome's borders that was a serious threat. The whole courage of the Sarmatians is, so to speak, outside themselves. No people are so cowardly when it comes to fighting on foot, but when they attack the foe on horseback, hardly any line can resist them. So someone had the great idea of us being shot at, Callum, by a Sarmatian horse archer. What, what are we actually doing here? So we're here simulating <laughs> battle line uh, responding to an opponent at speed and also at distance, which is our Sarnation Horse Archer. As infantry, we don't actually stand a chance of catching this kind of target, so we have to develop the tactic of doubling down and forming a solid battle line in order to weather that literal storm of I arrows. See. So I, I'm kind of lucky here, I've got a big 
legionary shield this one is it and you've yes. got you've got not quite as uh, go. as useful yeah. a defense crikey um yeah it's two different styles of uh, combat that we have to learn to work together uh, cohesively legionaries are very much your heavy infantry line uh, troop type Hence the larger shield designed for taking punishment, but also dishing out a lot of uh, high impact um, tactics. Your auxiliaries get a flatter oval shield that might not look like it uh, protects as much, but it is a very dynamic piece designed for um, actively fighting your opponent. But with, a with an opponent like this, there's no chance, even as a light infantryman, that I have to adopt the same kind of tactics and work together with the legionaries uh, to survive that kind of engagement. Still pinned down by our mounted foe, it was time to put my morning's lessons to good use and adopt a familiar defensive trick. Okay, Cam, so obviously the Romans are quite good, aren't they, as working together as a unit and sort of developing these techniques, basically, for defending against uh, archers or projectiles, what what can we do potentially to, to defend against this kind of attack if we know we're going to be here for a while? Well, let's just so what we do, yeah, perfect. Okay. So ones like that, we've, uh, so we've developed the, um, the line pretty well, covering ourselves. Another one is the very famous Testudo, okay. which involves the first line of troops essentially drop their shields uh, in front of them. And we mainly see legionaries do this because they have the better shields for doing this formation. So you will basically drop behind, completely behind that shield. Like so. Yeah. And okay. that's you not going anywhere. What your colleague then does is they produce another wall over the top which completely protects us from any kind of arrow fire. But the trick to getting this working well is moving in sync without to, to seal everything up without any kind of gaps open to the horse archer. Okay, let's see if this works then. Got another wave of attacks so coming. Simply call out it. Testudo. Okay. Testudo. Perfect time. Relaxed. Excellent. So, uh, we've weathered the storm. Sarmatians, they were used here, weren't they, in Britain? They certainly were. So, an yeah. asset for, for the Roman army, I guess. The Romans have a very good skill at, when they see a good idea, they integrate it into the Roman army. And that is essentially the whole purpose of the Auxiliary Corps. When they came up against um, the peoples of Sarmatia, the various uh, cavalry tribes. It was a cavalry the Romans didn't have. They had skill sets that the Romans weren't familiar with and fighting styles that they just they needed in their army to monopolize on. Things like horse archers were a much, a much needed element uh, within the Roman army. The Romans' ability to absorb the fighting potential of their erstwhile enemies is truly staggering. Imagine what the local population of Britain would have made of Sarmatian cavalry, or what the Sarmatians made of Britain. As Roman history wore on, the melting pot of martial cultures within and outside the empire's borders would begin to erode the recognisable legions of the 1st and 2nd centuries. After the internal chaos and financial meltdown of the 3rd century, Rome's mercenary-filled frontier armies would become hard to distinguish from those of the tribes they were fighting. But now wasn't the time to ponder the fall of civilization. I could smell dinner cooking. Okay, so we know that being a Roman soldier is a particularly physical job. Mm -hmm. One thing that goes hand in hand with that is having lots of food, energy, mm -hmm. calories. Generally, when we talk about military rations, we're talking about things that fill you up, not necessarily great tasting. Is that the case with Roman soldiers? To a degree, yes. I mean, the, uh, a soldier is issued 66 pounds of wheat, grain, right. per month. He's not given it all at once. He's given it at, at stages, you know, you get like see, see three times a, a week or something like that. But the end, aim of the ration is to ensure that he has three days supply of food with him at all times. Okay. That's the idea. But his grain um, comes in uh, in a whole form. So one of his tasks uh, within the Contubernium, that tent party of eight soldiers, is to grind up the grain to make flour. And from flour you can make bread or a thing called pulse 
Think of it more like a, a porridge or a pottage, something like that. So that's really what the, the staple part of the diet is. To which they also get a ration of smoked bacon or other fresh meat if it's available. Um, pork was the chosen meat of the Romans. Um, they didn't really f favor beef. And smoked bacon, of course, is, is preserved, so it will last longer. So if you're on a campaign, you're carrying your wheat ration with you, you've got your smoked bacon. Uh, to that are added uh, ration of uh, things like legumes and pulses, so your beans, your lentils, and things like this, and peas, uh, and olive oil, a drink called posca. Mm. That's the drink preferred by soldiers. So it's a, a mixture of wine and water. And uh, I want to say wine, I'm thinking you know, soured wine, so almost like white wine vinegar ish, mixed with water. You get a um, a slightly sour taste, but it's incredibly refreshing. It might seem weird to us, but Romans did not drink wine pure like we do. They would water it down. In fact, the idea of getting drunk was a, a social faux pas in oh, the really? higher, higher echelon. So not that soldiers would worry too much about that. Uh, by all accounts, beer was not particularly popular, I guess, until they arrive here and they discover the locals are making beer. And there isn't actually, a, one of the Vindolanda tablets says, uh, the, the patrol of north of the water is going well, but uh, we've run out of beer. Can you send more beer, please? That, that's got to be the first priority, it, right? Absolutely. Not, 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 <laughs> not more weapons or anything. No, no, we Just need beer. More beer, we need beer. We know that small civilian settlements grew up around most major Roman forts, catering to the needs of soldiers within the defences. Drinking establishments, brothels, and all manner of traders would set up along the main roads leading out of the camp. In many cases, it was in this town, called Avicus, that the unofficial wives and children of soldiers would take up residence. Soldiers, of course, wherever you put down a camp, like this one, there will be entrepreneurs who will set up restaurants, bars, whatever, mm. just outside the walls to part their soldiers from their cash. So, of course, then you get a little taste of mum's home cooking um, outside the fort. So yeah, there's also I'm, that option I'm as well. sure that the arrival of the soldiers probably provided a little boost to the local economy, didn't it? I would imagine so, yes. And just to clear up, no tomatoes. Absolutely not. Tomatoes are South American along with potatoes. Sorry, everybody. No, uh, no potatoes, no crisps, no chips. Uh, uh, even um, uh, pasta is not the same as, the, uh, as, as we have it today. So... Um, Pasta is actually more like egg noodles that come from the far east, so from China and things like that. So yeah, afraid not. No tomatoes. And if you haven't got tomatoes, you haven't got tomato sauce, so you don't have pizza. Okay, so the, the, the new Pompeii pizza, maybe more of a flatbread than a pizza. More likely that's a, a whole, flatbread a with something else. Debate, yeah. Isn't it? It, yeah, it is. Uh, if, it, if it's anything, it might be a pizza blanco. Whether pizza existed or not, I was still feeling rather hungry. Time to tuck in to my first century meal. Today you've very kindly prepared a nice, a nice stew. Well, you? what's what's in this? Following on from what I said about smoked bacon and legumes, we've got uh, basically uh, smoked ham hock and peas. So it's a pea and ham sort of soup, really. It looks, it looks pretty good actually. Mmm, it's mm. good, isn't it? Mmm, slow cooked gammon, yeah. basically. Basically, yes, yeah. That's very good. But that's one of the jobs that you see within the contubernium. One of the soldiers may well be cooking for the, his other seven colleagues. There's no, there's no uh, a sort of canteen or cookhouse or mess hall or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing like that. Um, you, basically, the soldiers cook for themselves. With a full belly at the end of a day's training, I was beginning to see why life as a Roman soldier was so attractive. Certainly, there were risks. Beyond those associated with war, our scant evidence shows that disease, drownings and even local bandits were all causes of death on the frontier. By the standards of the time, the army offered a well-paid and relatively stable career, with a generous pension offered to the estimated 50% who survived to see retirement. Regular soldiers could also rise remarkably far through the ranks, reaching third in command in a legion on merit alone. Life on the Roman frontier was undoubtedly harsh. But you've got to remember, the Romans were top of the food chain. They had the best weapons, the best equipment, and the best defenses. 
They were only really in trouble if they left this place and were caught out in the open in hostile territory. To be honest, the main concerns for Roman soldiers out here in the wild west of Britannia or anywhere on the frontier were every day. So things like the weather, morale, being far from home. To be honest, I just think it's really cool that 2,000 years after they were first building these forts, a Roman camp is dominating this landscape once again. Titus Flaminius of Legio 14 Gemini. Served as a soldier for 22 years, and now here I am. Read this and be more or less lucky in your lifetime.